there, friends, regular and new listeners. A warm welcome to Red Ice Creations Radio. My name is Henrik Palmgren, and this is Internet Talk Radio, broadcasted from Sweden, Scandinavia. On Thursdays and Sundays, we are here highlighting information and research for your consideration. We do not tell you what or how to think or what you should or shouldn't believe. We try to lay forth the information in the best way we can and help to highlight the research of various authors, filmmakers and researchers and bring their information to your attention. We do not claim that we are presenting or that we know the truth about everything, but we are searching for it and we are trying to find out what is going on now, what has been going on in the past and what we might expect in the future. This is about exploration. We think that you should make up your own mind about these subjects that we cover and continue the search for yourself if you find it interesting. So dare to explore the world and consequently yourself. Today we have author and researcher Michael Tessarion back with us on the show. It was about four or five months since we had Michael on and it's always a pleasure having him on. Today we're going to continue on the theme of astrotheology and sidereal mythology. This is the title, of course, of his latest book, and there is so many different topics that connect with this. We are going to focus on a few different things today. Uh, sorcerers and magicians, amonists, atonists, druids and scythians. And uh, for those of you who have been following our programs with Michael and uh, his work, you know that this will lead us into topics like the Ireland-Egypt connection, the identity of the Hyksos, the Templars and the Merovingians, the Phoenician, the Goths, the area, the sacred tree of the area, and the Scythians, and much, much more. Michael's website is michaeltesarion.com. That's Michael T S A R I O N.com. And there you can find links to his, to his other websites, Origins and Oracles.com, the MSAR Forum, Terrascopes.com, and much more. So with that, uh, welcome to the program, Michael. It's great having you back again. Uh, thanks, Henrik. Thanks for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure. We have so many different things that we want to get into today, and I want to kick this off right away. In July of this year, Michael released his fourth title, Astrotheology and Sidereal Mythology, a in-depth, thought-provoking exploration into the parent subject of common astrology and astronomy. And uh, this is one of the first books actually in print with the title or term Astrotheology. Uh, the book is the product of over 20 years of research into esoteric subjects. It is the companion to Michael's DVD released in 2006, also entitled Astrotheology and Sidereal Mythology. And uh, to get things going, get into the mindset, so to speak, of what we're going to talk about here today, I want to read a quote from your uh, your first chapter in the book and this is from Mrs. E. Valentia Straton's The Celestial Ship of the North. The religion of the ancient peoples seemed to have been one throughout the entire world, a great brotherhood, a universal faith. Strange has been the impulse of priests and theologians to deviate from the ancient holiness which was so solemn and majestic in primeval days and to instruct the masses in false doctrines. Any uh, comments on that, Michael? Well, you know, it's such a great passage. That's why I wanted to incorporate it in the book. Um, those, those four lines should convey to anybody just how important these great scholars were. You know, they were writing back in the 1800s, the early 19th century, the early part of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, priestly deception is what she's addressing that uh, strange it is why these people would want to set themselves up and do this. But that's right, you know. Uh, these are the people who have suppressed the ancient teachings, the ancient ways that were there to uplift all mankind. And in place of it, they put this, you know, Leviathan, this uh, institution of deception. And, uh, you see, we forget also that these individuals, you know, like like uh, E. Valentia Straton, you know, they were really sticking their necks out in those days because it was a lockdown situation. You know, in the 1800s, in the Victorian era, you could not, you know, uh, complain against the system or, or try to point out, you know, its uh, corruption. I mean, you could end up in a very severe state for doing that, you know. So um, to 
day we forget that, you know, where everybody thinks of themselves as a rebel. Uh, we've got to really understand that those people who looked into these religious matters for the very first time, you know, and they saw the levels of corruption that were happening, and they saw that the how this new, these new the, the Christian religion and all of these things had established themselves. They they were you know trying to teach the world this, only to find out that they would be jailed or that their books were being suppressed and so on. So you know it's uh, it's a situation of not only trying to reveal the levels of deception that have taken place, but these individuals you know often spent uh, time in jail. I mean, my book is partly dedicated to uh, Reverend Robert Taylor, who spent, you know, was sent to jail twice in his life for literally getting up in his church and telling people that the Gospels, the Old Testament, the New Testament, was based on astrology, you know? Mm -hmm. Threw him in jail for, for that. <laughs> and they even denied him writing paper. I mean, you know, there's clear evidence here. We're not talking any type of theory. There's clear evidence of priestly corruption, priestly deception. That's what you know, Evil and the Estratons' work was about. That's what these other mentors of mine were about, and that's what my work is about, is the continual process of trying to wake people up to this. Well, as you say, it's uh, it's lucky that these people actually weren't killed, because if we back up, you know, a few years, maybe a few hundred even, of course, but, I mean, p people were burned at the stake, tortured, you know, which is this, which is that, you know, so it's right. this is the environment that, that we have been in, you know. That's right. And we're very fortunate uh, in, in this day and age. Okay, people's work are being suppressed, of course. That that's another level to this. But at least uh, we can write and and talk about it. You know. Well, see, this, this and and that's why it's so important to talk and write about the, the right things because we we've, we've been given freedom, but freedom can also be terribly abused. These people in the past were not really permitted uh, the the freedoms that we have. But look at the monumental work that came out of that. Today we got all the freedom, but it's freedom to chew gum and, and you know watch TV and Doctor Phil and you know whatever other garbage you know where's my surfboard and uh, you know all sorts of palava, all sorts of nonsense, all sorts of information to the point of over indulgement, over stimulation, and yet the key facts about the world we're living in, the key facts about religion and the meaning of life, you know um, they kind of sometimes fall by the wayside. You know this great scholarship doesn't end. The tyranny doesn't end, and therefore the process of exposing that tyranny can never end. It can never rest. We're dealing with you know a tiger in the long grass here. We're dealing with a constant hunt and a constant safari into some very you know controversial areas. But it has to be done. And I'm very conscious of of the people who've been doing it in the past ages, and those people like you mentioned, the Giordano Brunos, you know, uh, and so forth and so on, who were literally taken out and executed for what they were talking about. Yes. Yes. And you know, your book features a lot of excerpts from uh, from um, your mentors, like Gerald Massey and uh, Alvid Boyne Kuhn and, and others, and a lot of their work uh, are out of print. It's hard to find. Uh, as I understand, you've been collecting their work for years. Now, was this a big motive for actually writing the book? Yeah, and this particular book, it was. A uh, good lot of the content is a carry-on from what I was doing with the Irish Origins of Civilization, but that's a double volume that was already, if you include the appendices, reaching the 2,000-page mark. Hmm. It was so, you know, voluminous and, and heavy that, you know, I, I couldn't even put the appendices in the book. I had to put them online. Yeah. Uh, that, that's fine because people are contributing all the time, so that was okay. But then there was a lot of content left over on astrotheology, which, you know, I would have loved to put in the book, but it was just impossible. So a good deal of that has gone into the astrotheology book. And then there's all the other study that I've been doing on that subject itself. It seemed that the time had come to not just uh, do a DVD. I'd done the DVD in 2006, but there was still so much material that you can't even, you know, get to. And I wasn't able to get to in either the DVD or the Irish Origin series. So it just it suddenly started to, you know, appear that it needed a book of its own, you know. But, yeah, the most important reason and the joy of it, my personal satisfaction, you know, out of it was to finally do justice to these mentors and to help introduce my readers to these individuals so that they might go on and procure these works and really get into the subject in depth, you know, and that has been happening, so it's great. Excellent. Uh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, let's dive into the subjects matter here. Uh, you know, last time we spoke of the symbol of the serpent and how it was used as a symbol of uh, of learning 
and royalty, both in Ireland and in Egypt. Uh, you said it was connected to the constellation Draco. And uh, I thought that this might be the reason for the Vikings actually using that shape, uh, shape for their ships, their ocean-going vessels, uh, and also for their earthworks. Uh, we can see this in Avebury and, and Ohio in America. Right, Michael? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We see the ancient Celtic god, Hearn, holding the serpent. And yet, aren't we, aren't we always told that there was no snakes in Ireland? And yet, <laughs> in one of the oldest images of God, the Celtic forest god, Hearn, is actually holding a snake. I mean, can, we, can people connect the dots here? We've got the Viking ships, uh, exactly the same type of dragon shape as we see in the Egyptian iconography of Horus or Set crossing the heavens, you see, in the serpent-shaped boat. You have uh, the Ohio serpent, which is a big earthworks in America, and what do you know? It just happens to be shaped like a serpent. We yeah. have exactly the same design in Scotland at a gigantic uh, Scottish um, earthworks, which I mentioned in the Irish Origins book. We have it in Avebury, like you're saying. We have serpentine motifs on most of the, of, of the megaliths, a good deal of the megaliths in Ireland, you see. As we said in the last show, yep, the royalty of both Ireland and Egypt, the people can refer to that show, you know, wore the serpent as a symbol of not only royalty, but of great wisdom. It was the, I always think of the serpent as the actual emblem of the stellar cult. And it's one of the classic, it's not the only one, but it's one of the classic images that if you study it, you absolutely can confirm my thesis, which is that there was a connection between the West and the East, and that there was a worldwide brotherhood of adepts, not just lo- you know, localized to one little area, like we normally think of the Druids as just little guys playing the harp over there in Ireland or whatever, right. but, you know, and even coming back to the Hearn symbol, that Irish god is sitting in the yoga pose, surrounded by the animals, you know, uh, holding the serpent and the ring. It's a, almost an identical pose to thousands of miles away in India when they found the images of Shiva. Uh, Shiva Shiva's title, Pashupati, meant Lord of the Animals. Yes. So the title is the same, the scenery is the same, the symbolism is the same, wearing the horns, you know, wearing the horns of the stag or the horns of the goat or the, or the, or the bull even. We've got Krishna, the same imagery, or the cross-legged Krishna playing the flute. We've got um, who is it? We've got uh, uh, Orpheus, because the Greeks picked up on this, and their Orpheus is based on the Isis uh, of Ireland. Then we've got uh, Sir Tristram, the harpist, you see, in the old um, Arthurian legend. And then we've got King David, the harpist, in the biblical tradition. Mm. All these dramatis persona, you see, are based on the original Celtic, Irish, Aryan uh, forest god. And Jesus, you know. Even even Jesus is born out of this. His name Isus, the full name Isus, is a direct translation of the of the old Celtic, Irish, Gaelic, you know, God of the West. Yes, and uh, I think we talked about this on on the last program we did. The that the Arya area took their uh, the cultural elements west due to the age of catastrophe. Uh, that's a theme that, that we talk very much of, about on this program, of course. So they they um, took their cultural elements west due to the uh, age of catastrophe and fall of the uh, pre-flood civilizations in Egypt. They were known as the Aryans, Ari or Aria, uh, but also as Shemsu Hur, or the disciples of Horus, right? That's right. In fact, uh, I think it's like 80 or 90 percent of the images of Horus, especially the early ones that were discovered, showed the god with blue eyes, green-blue eyes. And uh, Horus was even known as the god of the West, you know. Uh, no question about it, that he was a sun god that had been imported from elsewhere. Then they found ancient records talking about the blonde, tall um, visitors that were known as the Shamsu Hor, the disciples of Horus. They're nobody different than the uh, Westerners, you see, who I believe either completely brought uh, the cultural elements to Egypt or at least were major contributors to, you know, the... Um, to the Amonists and to Egypt, you know, bringing all of these elements, bringing all these word roots. So, and, and you're right, one of the word roots, the most important one was Ari or Arya. That's an old uh, Irish name for the goddess of Ireland. And you find it in terms like Saqqara, right? Yeah. In Egypt, you see, you find it in, in Algeria, right? In Madeira, you know what I mean? Yes. You find it in the, in the uh, word roots and the names. You find it in Bulgaria, 
and even Arabia, Arabia, right? Yes. Iran. The word Iran is nothing but the Farsi language. Okay, so Michael, you were just before the static took over there. We were talking about area or different uh, connotations of, of where this pops up in 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 the names and places. Uh, we mentioned Algeria, uh, people, uh, places like, uh, for instance, how, how about Armenia? Is is that a big uh, area as well? Yeah, Armenia. You see, um, we've got uh, like a Sumeria, Sumeria. You know, so, I mean, this could be coincidence or whatever, but, I mean, that term aria or era or era, like benares, right? People need to start becoming aware of these word roots because they're everywhere. And the word ara or aria simply meant the noble ones, you know, the high magi. And these are the people whose uh, knowledge helped found these cities and these nations. You know, so it, there's no question in my mind at all that the, the aria did move west in very early times, uh, both both before the great age of catastrophe, and then later there was movements uh, after the age of catastrophe, and that these individuals either started a lot of the cultures that we know today, the great civilizations of old, or at, at the very least were huge contributors, major contributors. You know, and when we're talking about Egypt, you know, I I've always said that I believe that as time progresses, we're going to find the evidence for this, and we already are. Yes. Well, now we, we're talking about the word. Airy or area. What about the connection to Western? Is there any any similarity between uh, what what the word area or area is and Western? Well, the word area actually means Western. Um, Iran, like we said, and even the word Syria means land of the Westerners, land of the area. The word Ireland, when it was translated into an I R land, I mean it's very 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 basic because Ir land, land of the R. Yes. Western land. Yeah. So the, the word Arya means the West. Yep. Straight up. Interesting. And, uh, you know, you maintain that the Druid uh, or Arya were, were astrologers, uh, but did they not also take care of, of uh, the Earth, kind of administrators of, of uh, well, I guess we could refer to it as, as actually a, a sick planet, so a planet that needed healing. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, my work goes very much into that idea that um, the Druids' function was pretty much like a paramedic would be today. That these individuals had a very close as a, you know, relationship to the earth. I mean, we already just been saying that they worshipped the earth as a goddess, and so as a mother, as a mother goddess, in exactly the same way as the Egyptians did, and most of these primeval cultures did. And so after the age of catastrophe, uh, since so few animals and so few human beings were left, what the, the humanity, humanity that was left, they were thinking about themselves and their own welfare, but they were also very concerned about the state of the earth. And so this elite group of shamanic elders that we're talking about, the Druids, they, they were very much there to see to the earth itself. And this implied the building of a lot of stone circles. So when you see Stonehenge, you see, you see Avery, and you see a lot of these different... Uh, sites, and people have always marveled at these places, they don't understand that, you know, the big question is, why were they built? And one of the reasons they were built is because this operation of lifting heavy stones and bringing them to a central place had a great deal to do with what is known as geomancy. Yes. Uh, and geomancy was nothing more than the healing of the earth energy, because they were aware of it. They were aware of ley lines, dragon paths, synchronic lines, axiotonal lines, you see. I've gone into this in all my work. And the Druids were the elite of these groups who absolutely knew how to work with the energies of the earth in order to heal it from the damage that it had you know, received during this unbelievable cataclysm that happened somewhere you know, between 10 and 13,000 years ago. Now, speaking of uh, old megalithic stone circles, uh, there's also, of course, the theory that these were uh, astronomical uh, markers. Do, do you subscribe to that idea, Michael? Oh, yeah, they were, in the same way that even later temples and shrines and buildings are astronomical, because remember, these druids were very concerned of and always aware of the connections between the sky goddess and the earth goddess. They always saw it as being interrelated, you know, and uh, the stone circles were built with these famous standing stones, these, uh, which were always aligned either to the midsummer point or to the winter solstice or to the equinoxes. The stones were also aligned all, often to the important constellations, and even to individual stars that rose and set. So each 
stone circle has to be studied on its own separately. It has to be studied in context of why it's placed on that particular part of the Earth, uh, what kind of energies of the Earth, you know, we're talking uh, geomancy here, are in operation, uh, whether it's path, you know, whether it's geopathic, meaning a bad energy place or a good energy place. And they also have to be studied individually based on what kind of constellations they're aligned to. Some yes. are to the sun, some are to the moon, uh, some are both. And incredibly, some stone, uh, I would say that some of the most major stone circles in the world are aligned to other stone circles. Each of these different megalithic sites uh, are aligned to other megalithic sites. Right, uh, like, course, like, like uh, Carl uh, Monk pointed out with, the, with the, his research on, on the code, right, that there's a whole intricate system between these different locations. That's right, and um, exactly, and I, I had proven this to my own satisfaction back in 1985 when I had gone out into the field in Ireland to do this. Now, of course, it's not easy to do because, remember, these megalithic sites have been terribly tampered with. They've been destroyed by farmers, and uh, just in the same way that Tara in Ireland is, is now being desecrated, you see, by all these uh, governmental concerns. Mm. Uh, so, of course, they wanted to mess and tamper and destroy these ancient megalithic sites because the last thing that this orthodoxy today wants you to know is the amount of you know uh, genius and the amount of astronomical and astrological and and trigonometrical and navigational genius that the ancient peoples had, but the fact still remains that yes, these sites were connected uh, geomantically, astrologically, uh, and so forth and so on to other sites and also to the to the various uh, luminaries and constellations. No doubt about it. Let's talk a little bit about uh, numbers, uh, sacred the sacred numbers of the area, uh, like three and 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 twelve, um, and this of course we obviously can see pop up in in many religion religions, you know the, the Holy Trinity and the, the the twelve apostles, what have you, but also in in uh, political orders today. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh yeah, the, the number three. Look how many flags, tricolors. They're even called tricolors. Well, why not four colors or five colors or, you know, whatever? Three colors appears on, you know, so many flags of the world. Uh, three steps up to in the Masonic initiations. Three chairs in the Congress room. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, uh, it used to be three judges, you know, and, and the symbol of three. I mean, in architecture, in state regalia, in the royals, uh, 12, the Roman legions, the Roman... Um, Priestarchies used to surround themselves by twelve, you know, attendants, and all the different gods of the world, like Baldur and and, and uh, Odysseus, and all the heroes. So many heroes. You know, the number twelve turns up in countless uh, situations in the story of Hercules. Yes. You know, in the story of of uh, various heroes of the world, all over the world, and more importantly, you have the same zodiac. There have been variations. But basically, throughout the entire world, when you find an astrological people who use the zodiac, it's the 12 signs, and they're identical. The signs are the same, and mostly even the animal uh, you know, totems are the same. Yes. So, like I said, a few variations, but anyone can see that it's one zodiac all throughout the world. How could that be if, if we've been told it's just all independent, heterogeneous development? Of hmm. course, that's a complete and utter lie. It's just like you were talking earlier about the serpent boats and the dragon symbol. Yes. Well, that's because there was a thing called a dragon court in operation in ancient days. There was a, a homogenous worldwide order we're dealing with here, you know, a brotherhood mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the corrupt version of that brotherhood is operating today in the world. So, you know, the zodiac is the same. If you study the zodiac, you find the 12 or 13 signs. You find the lunar zodiac of 13 signs, the 12. You find the solar zodiac of 12 signs. And then you have a stellar zodiac as well. So all these zodiacs are to be found all over the world. Well, who took them there? How come they're so identical? Mm -hmm. You see, this is another question that a lot of people don't want to ask. The numerology is as important as the uh, you know etymology. Indeed. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, you know, there are more constellations, of course, in the in the zodiac than the twelve that that are commonly known. And and uh, you bring these up now and then, and you put a lot of emphasis on these. T tell us about these other ones beyond the the commonly known twelve. Well, this, was, this is uh, true, for a start. Uh, what you're talking about there is the stellar zodiac that's slightly different than what people know as the western tropical zodiac. It, there's at least 76 other constellations, making about 88 in all. 
And there may even be more than that. But as far as the ancient stellar system is concerned, there was about 88 constellations on what's called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is nothing more than the passage of the sun around the sky, you know, during the day and the night. Uh, that is a path. Astronomers consider the movement of the sun like it's on its own little path. Yes. And that, that line or path, hypothetical line, is called the ecliptic. But, and it's on that path, and this is for people who have no idea about astrology, it's on that path that the sun moves its own belt, the orbit of the sun, passes by the famous 12 constellations. And that's how we get the zodiac. The thing is that, as I said, there are more than just those 12 constellations. Now, I dealt with this in my DVD called The Subversive Use of Sacred Symbolism in the Media, in which I also delved into astrology. Why? Because it turns out that not only do the famous 12 signs of the zodiac, and we're talking about the lion, the bull, the archer, you know, mm. uh, these, these various symbols of the famous 12 signs, but the other signs, the other 76 signs, those images and symbols keep appearing in the corporate media, in advertising, in logo design, and all the rest of it. And they also appear in the Old Testament, in the Bible. So when you're hearing about Jonah being swallowed by the whale, you see, or, uh, you know, one of the great heroes having to fight a seven-headed uh, hydra, mm -hmm. you see what I mean? And, or uh, various, various uh, anecdotes about what Jesus, you know, the miracles he would have done. Uh, coming in, or coming in front of the seven stick candelabra and all of this palava that you read in the Bible can be decoded because those symbols are, are still astrological. So when you have these morons and idiots who read our work saying, "Well, there's no connection between astrology and the Bible," that's because they haven't bothered studying any of this stuff, and so they think that you're just talking about you know Leo and and, and all the famous signs of the, the zodiac that they're aware of. They haven't bothered to study the subject; they're just reacting. And they don't know that the symbols that are in the Zodiac, you are finding them mentioned in the Bible, period. Hmm. Whether it's the burning bushes, you know what I mean, or, or, or the serpent and the staffs that you find Moses and the Pharaoh, you know, doing that bit, yes. or the mention of the great river of initiation, or, or even characters like John the Baptist, or the leper, you know what I mean, or the, the donkey that Jesus rides into Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. You see, well, that's a symbol of cancer, the sign of cancer. But if you didn't know that, well, you're probably going to believe the story as it's written, thinking that really happened, hmm. instead of realizing, no, it did happen, but it happened up there in the heavens, not physically on earth at any physical Jerusalem. Hmm. So this opens the whole can of worms, you see, into the study of astrotheology to realize how you can decode all the scriptures and the Bible. And I don't just mean the Bible itself. I'm talking about all the other apocryphal scriptures as well. You, you have to understand this it also impacts things like the Gnostic Gospels. It impacts the Book of Enoch. It impacts all uh, what's called, you know, these uh, Essene books. Yes. And all the other books that were left. Yeah, the whole world of, of what is called, you know, Judeo-Christian scriptures can all be decoded from the Book of Revelation into the Book of Enoch into the Book of Jasher and all the other, you know, uh, miscellaneous books that we're talking about here in religion. And, that's, and the elites in Christianity and Judaism know that. That's why those books were expurged in the first place, is because they contain too much obvious astrological information, and people would have spotted that right off. So they, they purged them from the Bible. And all that was left in the Bible was the stuff they thought, you know, might be able to, uh, you know, appear to be history and appear to be biography. Yes. My work points out that it's not history and it's not biography as much as it is mythology, and astrotheology. You, you know, I just want to spend a, a, a few minutes and ask you about this because I, I think that this is fascinating. Talking about astrological signs in in regards to uh, archetypes or even psychology, because one thing that obviously pops up here is the idea of why would the media be using these different astrological signs, especially if, if they're using the non-common 12 ones. Uh, for, I mean, for those who aren't aware of them, how the heck can they, they still affect us, Michael? Because that goes into, as you said, the whole question of psychology. That goes into the whole question, and this is you know highly esoteric area here, for the student who comes to finally understand that when you're talking astrology, you are in fact talking psychology. Hmm. And uh, most astrologers you know, will, will accept this and agree with this. It's kind of known. But laymen don't know this. They're going to have to start finding art, because when you're dealing with the astrology, you are actually, it's just two words for the same thing. Astrology is about human beings, it's about man as man, it's about man's consciousness. In fact, the zodiac, I refer to it always as inner, it's an inner zodiac. 
the other zodiac that we're talking about is really nothing more than a reflection of a man, you know, his, his own inner being. This is why they have the Jesus, the main solar being, with his 12 helpers or 12 disciples. Yes. This is a, you know, a fictive scripting of exactly what we're talking about. When the hero, be it Odysseus or, you know, whoever, Hercules or Balder or whoever, who has his 12 helpers or his 12 emanations or his 12 trials, this is all about consciousness. But we have forgotten the golden keys that unlock the mystery. Why these corporate people would use these symbols is because they know what we're talking about on this show right now. They know that when they're dealing with the Zodiac, they're dealing about you. That these are the 76 or 88 or 12, you see, versions of you. Yes. Not just your conscious mind, but your entire being, everything about you. So when they work in archetypes, they are working with the supreme language. They're able to open up your, you know, hard drive. They have access right into the core of who you are on a completely psychic level. There you go. And, and that means that they could, uh, if you're not familiar with these ideas or concepts, they could be uh, pulling the strings of you, so to speak, without you knowing what the heck, uh, you know, why you're responding in a certain way or why you're attracted to certain things. And I believe that only through awareness of it, you might be able to uh, to catch them when they're you know, trying to pull your strings, so to speak. Once you know it, you can. I mean, that's the, you know, the, the learning curve. Yes. That gives you the immunity. Uh, in fact, you can even do more than that. You can actually start using these symbols for your own spiritual positive uplift, which was what they were originally for. That starts when you finally start to grasp that there's no such thing as magic rays from some you know rocks out there in space. When you really fully grasp, you know, my one of my life's main thesis, which is the whole idea of the inner zodiac, the inner oracle. This is what is being assaulted by these uh, people. They have their muddy boot prints all over your psyche. Because they know what you don't know. Your temple is wide open to every, you know, derelict to come in and just, you know, urinate on. Hmm. This, is, this is why the people are so psychically deranged today. Is because they don't own their own consciousness anymore. They're not, they're not, they don't have possession over their own being. They've given it away to Madison Avenue and all of these other sorcerers, you see. Yes. Who are using the symbolism. And of course these sorcerers don't uh, uh, hide it. But what they do do is they create a whole media spin, a second level, um, uh, uh, rebuttal of any of this. Yes. They're not into yes. esoteric stuff. You're crazy. It has nothing to do with this. You know, these are just uh, symbols that, you know, and, and people fall for this without any understanding of how this uh, sort of uh, sorcery works. Indeed. I mean, and, and again, this should be pointed out that now and again, you do get hints of it. Uh, you know, people like uh, Clotaire Rappé, uh, you know, he's, he's using, uh, you know, a special kind of marketing, what he refers to as the code in order to break, you know, and, and, and get through uh, with the help of psychology. You know, we have even banks using uh, astrology. So th this is beginning to, to get known, but it's still very kind of esoteric and many people still uh, haven't got a clue what's going on, you know. And he's only one of the, he's only giving you the tip of the iceberg. Yes. You know, the, 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 the time of the, uh, oh, your credit card companies use it. They use the lunar cycle, what's known as the lunar cycle, which is a 28-day cycle for each month. Uh, incredible uh, precision into not only using the symbolism of the moon, uh, but, uh, yeah, again, all of the stellar symbolism is being used right today as a form of sorcery. Uh, you do get hints of it. You certainly start getting more than hints of it when you have pattern recognition and you start to see how often it's used in the media and even in certain movies and certain logos and graphics. And uh, also realize that even the word media comes from the, the, the people who are called the Medes, an ancient group of people who were specializing in this exact kind of mind control and sorcery. Yes. A very ancient group from the Middle East who specialized in this. Uh, they, were, they were the original Magi coming out of Persia, north of Persia, is a place called Medea. Yes. And the place was known for its, its, uh, its witches and its sorcerers and people who were adept at putting spells on people. You know what I mean? So we're, we're in, the, the business has never gone away. It's, it's the best business that you can get into if, you know, once you know what, what's going on. And these people are doing it. And it's about the control of human minds through nonverbal communication. Simple as that. And I and I think that people actually are on, on so many levels, especially unconsciously, attracted to these, uh, you know, different variations. If we talk about numerolo numerology of 12, if we talk about the cycles of the moon, 28 days, this is something that is so 
uh, hardwired, if you will, into the human being, into the genetics even of a human being. So when these things are going to pop up in the, what I would say, the unnatural world, the, the, the man-created world, we're going to identify with them and, and get a kind of sense of a, a connectivity with that. What do you think, Michael? Well, see, the confirmation of that is, is a female. Look at the female generative cycle. The menstrual cycle is connected to the phases of the moon. You know, I mean, blinking uh, amoeba at the bottom of the oceans, you know, plants that can grow in complete darkness still obey the rhythms of the lunar cycle. Yes. And, and then we earlier on we talked about the druids and the matrix, the geospheric matrix of the Earth. That geospheric matrix, just like the ocean, the energy waves, these are like the veins and arteries and capillaries of a human being. Well, the Earth has these synchronic lines, uh, which are sometimes called ley lines, um, uh, I remember you had uh, Dan T on talking about the ley lines, remember? Dan Tatman, yes, indeed. Right, and, and, and specifying that there's some sort of misunderstanding about ley lines and, and how this whole thing works. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and we've got underground rivers. We've got uh, all these kinds of interlocked matrices of the Earth. They also respond, you see. But matter responds to material energies, and so does the human mind. Hmm. But the thing is that the human mind also projects its own content out onto the material world. This is what we're not too familiar with. That's what these sorcerers are familiar with. They know that your consciousness also has certain numerological you know, uh, encodations, certain matrices from the time of birth. It's just, it's just built into consciousness. Yes. The three and the seven and the four and the twelve. I've gone into this in my work. People can go to the Taroscopes website, and I have a web stream there called the Taroscopes Tour. It's actually an introduction for people who are interested in my mystery school teachings. But if they actually go and watch that, we have a thorough analysis of this whole mental matrix and how there is such a thing as the inner zodiac that then gets you know, subsequently projected externally, and then we imagine that it's something outside of ourselves, when in fact it's completely an extension of what is known as man's markaba, his own aura. It's a, an extension of his mental uh, apparatus, you see. And the people who understand this absolutely are the puppet masters who are able to control people by this nonverbal levels of communication and steer your political beliefs, steer your religious beliefs. They can work on the limbic realms of your brain, the mammalian brain. So you're not even aware of it. You know, you're not even aware of it because it's bypassing your conscious circuitry. It's bypassing the, the superego and, and, the, and the ego's defense mechanisms. Now, talking about how this also reflects in the, in the external world, we can get into... Uh, you know, speaking of geomancy and even into architecture, if we look at the design of towns and, and cities, uh, there is a heavy use of geometry and astrological symbolism there uh, in the fountains, in the square, clock towers, etc. Do you think that it's it's the same motivation that is behind this, uh, that this is the reason why they're using this, you think? Yeah, there's no doubt about it, because in one way, corrupt as they are, these uh, modern-day you know, uh, uh, sorcerers is basically the only term I can think of that would describe them per perfectly is because I always see what they do as an act of sorcery. Corrupt as they are, they still hold over. Remember, as I, I said in all my work, these are the cannibalizers and the plagiarizers of an ancient sacred canon. So, it, but that doesn't mean that the canon is, is evil or negative. Right. So these individuals are misusing this. So their, their buildings... Their parliaments, their um, institutes, right down to even schools and colleges, but certainly military bases, inland revenues, uh, think tanks, churches. And, and, you know, work has been done on this, but there's so much more needs to be done to really bring this out. Because one of the, I mean, even one of the first men who looked into this, David Ovison, who wrote the fine book, you know, uh, called uh, The Architecture of Our Nation's Capital. Yes. He delves into all the Masonic stuff. You know, he tells you clearly and distinctly there that he has not the faintest idea why this is being done. So even he's a man who's, you know, gone and measured it, gone and photographed it, talks about it, has delved into archives and memoirs and all sorts of, you know, uh, archives to expose that this is absolutely happening, is then telling you, but I really don't know why these guys would be doing this. Yeah, and, and exactly. And, and he's even, uh, you know, a mason, mason himself, so one would think that, okay, he knows it all, right? But uh, more more evidence in a way that many people are are joining orders and things like this and, and don't have the full picture, you know. They don't. I have a quote actually from because Graham Hancock and Robert Bouval delved into the designs of Paris in their book Talisman, and they borrow, you know, this. I think it's a 
second book from Overson, and they move on and they talk about the same thing. I have a quote from Hancock from that very book in which he says, you know, it's open to debate as to why these guys are doing it. He throw, basically, he's even throwing up his hands and, and not seeing it. And that's because these people do not understand the basic facts that, there is, that these individuals are hell-bent on the control of human minds. They still haven't got their head wrapped around that. They're still thinking this is some sort of Templar, Brotherhood of Light, etc., who are going to do, work all these wonders for us. Right. So, of course, they, they don't see the underlying motives, you know what I mean? But, you know, you just have to call a spade a spade and realize that they're doing this to empower themselves so that when they put these filthy estates and hideous suburbs and our bloody schools and all this stuff, it's on geopathic places where, you know, the energy is going to be down. In America, when they build everything on the grid, do you know how toxic and negative and geopathic it is to build on a, on a square uh, sort of matrices? Right. you think they would go and do that, right? That's because they know that this is the perfect control mechanism for the perfect slave to live in his perfect uh, prison, but it's an ambient prison that he's not aware of. It's, not in the, it's only on the periphery of his understanding. He's clueless, and this, is, this works as the perfect cage setup. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So they know that if they manufacture your habitat in this anti-organic, spiritualist way that goes against the energies of the earth, if they build their cities like that, if they uh, build their freeways like this, if they put these ugly glass towers, these big phallic, you know, super lit, <laughs> fluorescent lit, armored buildings, that's mm. going to send a message to people's psyche. So of course. of course when somebody turns around and goes and denies any of this, I look at that person and go, yeah, that's because you're the perfect slave. You're the perfect one that you're there, that you are their perfect mannequin who doesn't even know that it's taking place so much the control that you're under, you see? Yeah. yeah hmm. It works. It's fantastic. It's an incredible experiment. That's why the man who opens his eyes to this is a perpetual outsider. And he better get used to that. He better get used to the pain and the suffering that comes with being an outsider because my message is at least you can see it. At least you may have a bit of suffering because of this and to feel like an outsider, but you better always get on your knees and thank goodness that you can actually see what we're talking about here so that you're not completely, you know, uh, uh, completely uh, uh, unaware of it and just like a, a perfect slave, you know? Yes. I mean, it's again, we come back to that famous uh, scene uh, actually from the first Matrix movie. Do you want the red pill or the blue pill? And, and uh, Absolutely. You know, I can offer you no more. I, I, the only thing I can show you show you is the, is the truth, and, and it's up to you of you know how we want to want to deal with that. And and of course, many people uh, would want to go back to you know cloud cuckoo land again and, and and live there because it's 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 safe and it's uh, you know uh, it, it's it's uh, more comfortable, I guess. And uh, and it's up to each each and everyone how, how far we want to go. But again, you know, I just want to emphasize that and, and, and go back to that that idea that. Uh, astrology, the, the suppression of this knowledge, how important that is, especially from if we consider the the ancient religions, uh, you know, or, or you know Christianity, that we have to con- they have to constantly suppress that in order to actually keep this spell upon you. Because if this were widely uh, widely known and people were beginning to get uh, savvy about this, then they would be able to to break this spell that that is uh, you know surrounding them, that that this is causing you know putting upon people basically. Absolutely. Knowledge is your salvation. The greatest, as Socrates said, the greatest evil is ignorance. The greatest uh, good is knowledge. Period. You know, uh, we can do like this. We can begin to dive into a little bit about some of the, uh, uh, you know, more of the background about this, so to speak, in regards to Egypt. We can talk a little bit more about uh, Akhenaten and and, uh, and actually get into some of the uh, ideas about astrology and and how that was being used in the ancient days there was a, a great schism in, in Egypt during the time of Akhenaten over over astrology and over the age of Aries and the uh, the the age of ta- uh, Taurus tell us about that if you will well that's right this uh, in fact uh, studying secret societies this becomes extremely important and this was brought out very very well by Ralph Ellis in his book Jesus last of the Pharaohs in which uh, he had one section on astrology, what I would call astrotheology, uh, and it, it had to do with the period of expulsion of Akhenaten and his Atonists. Um, they divided. They, after leaving Egypt, in fact, what, one of the reasons they were in conflict, you see, you have to realize that there was a, always a pharaoh of the, of the south and a pharaoh of the north, and there's a lot of uh, this kind of uh, rivalry in Egypt, and the rivalry was taken to an extreme during the reign, reign of Akhenaten because he not only you know, had uh, dynastic rivalries, he brought in a whole other kind of worship. 
he brought in the whole worship of Atonism, uh, which was, you know, tremendously resisted by people. And, and finally, they had to expel the guy because of his, you know, mania. And so he exacerbated these rivalries that exist. In fact, many people who've studied a little bit of the, you know, history of myth- mythology know that the, there was a famous conflict between the god Set and the god Horus. Yes. Well known, you know, a light versus dark kind of a conflict. Mm-hmm. Many scholars and many people have read on Egypt. But not a lot of people realize that that was actually based on the physical rivalry of physical peoples. Uh huh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The worshippers of the god Set and the worshippers of the god Horus were in conflict. So the story of Horus and Set's conflict is actually mimicking, uh, telling the story of a political, uh, sort of a dynastic rivalry that were taking place. But after, anyway, the, uh, it's like the good guys won, you know, in my reading of Egypt, the good guys won and they were able to get rid of the Sakhanaten. But as soon as he, he leaves, they, uh, his own group divided. And the divisions were all based on the movement of the sun and its, its position. Because there are the 12 houses of the zodiac, and the sun moves backwards through these houses very, very slowly. And so they couldn't decide, you see, whether they should be the worship of the, the old pattern, the, the god of Taurus, or the, the sign of Taurus, mm-hmm. or the, and the Atonists were always into the sign of Aries, you see, because they believed that the sun had moved house and that a different kind of worship and a different kind of reverence towards the sun, uh, you know, the god of light, was to, was to be coming into effect. So again, astrology plays a huge part in this, because these secret societies literally divided themselves. They literally arranged themselves. Then what do we find out later? The Bible is telling you the story of the tribes of Israel dividing themselves into 12, 12 you know, groups, again, based on astrology. And each of the 12 uh, uh, tribes of Israel have a specific symbol or a specific banner, each of which are astrological, Henrik. <laughs> really? Yeah, each are astrological. And, and these divisions, so of course now when you've really done your homework, you realize that the Bible's Israelites are nothing more than these same Atnas that I'm talking about. They yes. are, it's just a cover story in the Bible, making them look like something they weren't. But who they really were was these Egyptian pharaonic Hyksos you know, peoples, these kings, these hereditary kings of, of lower Egypt, who had uh, you know, been exper- exposed, uh, exiled or whatever you want to call it, and even they carried their schism over into post-exilic times in which they couldn't decide on this astrological matter. So astrology plays a tremendous part. That's why when you see the symbol of the lamb and you see the symbol of the ram and you hear about the bull, you know, Mithra slaying the bull, you see, yes. or uh, Tiresias or Odysseus going and fighting the bull or uh, various other anecdotes that you find. Or, you know, same just like in the Bible with, you know, Daniel in the lion's den or whatever. All of these things that you're reading about in the Bible, especially the story of the Israelites and the creeping death and the ten plagues of Israel, all of that stuff is a reference to conflicts that took place because of astrology. Hmm. That's, That's how important it was to the ancient peoples. That's fascinating. And, and you know, talking about this expulsion or, or you know, Exodus, uh, Raphael has been on the show, obviously, through talking about this, but we can emphasize this again, that there were actually were, were two different Exoduses, right? Well, that's true, and that's very, very important for people to realize that there was not one exodus, but two, and that the Bible story is a fusion of two stories in one. And the first exodus happened many, many years before Akhenaten. It actually began, it took place at what's known as the opening of the 18th dynasty. Uh, Akhenaten's reign was towards the close of the 18th dynasty, but approximately about 300 years before his reign, a huge group of uh, Hyksos pharaohs, who were, you know, corrupt, corrupt so occult, had been expurged in a mass exodus, and they, le- they left Egypt in a state of absolute misery and, and, and poverty when they left. Hmm. This is the famous uh, exodus that is rescripted in the Bible, you know, with the, the so-called story of the, of the tribes leaving. Yes. And how they were able to take oxen and camels and gold and all this stuff, you know. Of course, that, of course, makes... Uh, makes lunacy of the story that there were slaves in Egypt. How can slaves in Egypt be taking all this wealth out with them, you know what I mean? So you've got big questions there about that, but even leaving that aside, that, that was a gigantic exodus in which these people leaving Egypt basically looted it and burned whole cities to the ground and stuff like that. Hmm. Then three, four hundred years later, you've got Akhenaten being kicked out in a secondary, much smaller, but very, very significant exodus. My work picks up from that because the exodus of those people is... Um, signified a great deal of importance for Ireland's history, because they didn't just vanish into the, you know, Palestinian desert, like we're told, and just disappear off the face of the earth. These people who were exiled uh, 
made a made their way west, and part of that process it took a uh, several hundred years, but the descendants of those Atanas being kicked out of Egypt actually ended up in Ireland and are a key part of Ireland's mythology, and I'm the first person to deal with that connection and show how these Atanas from Egypt came in to continue to destroy, you know, and are very much involved in the in the persecution and destruction of the Druids, in fact. Uh, I think that this is a good place to run things up here for our first segment, Michael. Uh, so let's take a short break here and continue then our conversation. We're going to get into a little bit more uh, later on here what it uh, all means, basically, that we should uh, you know, remind ourselves what these historical anecdotes has to do with today's world. We've talked a little bit about the background of, of astrology, of course, how this connects with psychology and how this is being used today. We're also going to talk more about uh, the Hyksos, the Pharaohs, uh, the Israelites and Judites of the Bible, and obviously the Scythians, and this is, will lead us into fascinating areas like the Atnes, the Templars, and even the Knights of Malta. Uh, and obviously also I do want to ask Michael a little bit later on about the fight that has been going on between these two sides that, uh, that you mentioned, Michael, that this is uh, basically between an old astrological age and a new one coming in. And I want to ask you a little bit later if this is reflected in any way what is going on today in the world, if there is a new... And uh, an old world world order is that why they're using this terminology Pisces versus versus Aquarius here? Fascinating. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of that later on here. But in closing and to round things up for this segment, Michael, mention your website and how people can get a copy of your latest book, Astro Theology and Sidereal Mythology. Oh, absolutely. They, they can just go to my main website, uh, MichaelTasarian.com. That's a navigation page. They'll be able to see the AstroTheology.net link. Or they can just go astro-theology.net or .org and go straight in there to the website. There's excerpts, there's links to previous interviews, and a lot of source material, a lot of free material there so people can get into this. Uh, I'm having a DVD coming out on astrotheology in a, a couple of weeks, which will be a, another companion uh, to both this astrotheology book and to the Irish Origins book. So people can look for that, keep in touch, or email me for data information on that it's a new dvd coming out uh again covering some of these subjects but the book right now is available at astrotheology.net uh people can go in there and, and get it you know fascinating and again uh, the website is michaeltesarian.com that's the main website the main hub and that will get you to all of these other websites and so forth uh thank you very much for listening out there do join us in the member section uh, for this segment thank you very much michael stay with us we'll take a short break and we'll be right back With love beside us To fill the night with the song We'll hear the sound of violins Out yonder where the blue begins The moon will guide us As we go drifting along Can't we still wait Daisy pedal over the rim of the hill. Can't we still wave on a little dream and settle high on the crest of a thrill? Let's build a stairway to the stars. A lovely, lovely stairway to the stars. It would be heaven to climb. To heaven with you The moon will guide us. 
us As we go drifting along 